Thank you, Deb. Uh, good morning. Welcome to everybody here and online, and we're, we're glad that you're here with us. Um, just a couple of announcements. The uh, hymn sing and dessert potluck is coming up May 29th. Uh, the baby bottle fundraiser is continuing if you want to uh, pick up a bottle and add some cash. Um, uh, do, 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 July, June 9th is the annual ultra p p church picnic and the start of our summer worship schedule with one 930 service. If you're new here, we invite you to the Welcome Center in the foyer and we continue as Tim leads the call to worship. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together, body, your in spirit as we read our call to worship. Praise our God, all you who serve him, and those who fear him, small and great alike. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever.
Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one King reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God of days. None above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the
God, you are almighty God. You are ruler over all things. And when we declare that, we declare it not only in joy and in hope, but also as a comfort that whatever darkness gathers around us, that you are Lord over us and over all creation. I pray that you would bless the rest of the service. Be with us as we look to you. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ.
finger, that that would just be nothing serious. And finally, Father, we just want to rejoice with our, our sister uh, Carolyn uh, Mahoney for her son Paul, who has long battled um, these, these issues with his heart. And we thank you, Lord, that he was able to find a match and get a new heart, that he was able to get this transplant uh, earlier this week. And we just pray that that will continue to be successful. Uh, that the recovery and adjustments and everything would just go smoothly and that Paul would just have uh, just a better quality of life. We, just, we thank you for that. And we we want to rejoice with, with them. And uh, again, Father, we thank you for this time that we get to be together. Would you please fill us and would you please help us to worship you now spiritually. Join me as we close this time of prayer here by reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us on our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We thank you for all the many, many things you've blessed us with. We give back a portion of it to you today. Uh, thank you, Lord. All right, the, the children from kindergarten through age five, or, uh, or grade five, rather, are 
dismissed for Children's Church. Looks like they're already headed out. And as they head out, let's turn our attention to the reading of God's Word, starting with our Old Testament passage, which is 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. All right, 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 9. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the, ki- what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. All right, our second reading, the gospel reading, is from Matthew, uh, starting in chapter 4, verse 23, and through 5 in the first part of verse 2. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And finally, our New Testament readings from Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be, will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Good morning. I am incredibly excited uh, to be with you guys. A couple months ago, David asked if I'd be willing to preach uh, or to do the sermon for this morning, and he said I could preach on whatever I wanted. So that's a lot of that's a lot of liberty. Um, what will what I'll be uh, going over today is not Ephesians, uh, but it does kind of relate a little bit to what Derek brought up last Sunday, and that how all things are united under Christ, and how that's part of the meta narrative of the scriptures and the meta narrative of history. Um, Pretty much to start off, I love stories, although I was never in an honors English class and would never read the books in high school, Um, but I loved being in conversation or when we would have peer group conversations, I loved hearing my classmates and peers wrestle and make sense of the story about themes or symbolisms or whatever. Sometimes it was great, sometimes it, it, anyways, whatever, it was empty. but I also know that I'm not alone and that I love stories. I, the, I looked at the top five most sold literary works of all time, and four of them, uh, four of the top five are stories. And the one that isn't is the quotes of Mao Zedong, which is the Little Red Book, and 
there should be an asterisk next to that one because he forced everybody to pretty much buy his book. So does it really count? I don't know. You can, you can make that decision for yourself. Um, but I think the reason why, as, as a, honestly, as, a, as humanity, we love stories, why they're not philosophical works that really grab us, scientific works or poetic works, but stories, is because in some sense we see our life as a story. And that when I hear people ask the question, what is the purpose of my life? Or what is the meaning of life? In some sense, that's another question is, or it's the other question is, what is, does my story have any meaning? What is the purpose of my story? What is my story a culminating to? And how does it fit in with the grand narrative of what's happening, if there even is a grand narrative? And I, I'm excited because this morning, what I'll be talking about is the kingdom of God. And I think it is the fundamental call of all believers, the primary teaching of Jesus, and the, the primary drama that drives the biblical story. And so pretty much to start off with, what is the kingdom of God? Well, the word kingdom actually gives us a clue in that the word freedom is to be in the state or is to be in the state of being free, and to be bored is being in the state of being bored. Um, and so kingdom is being in the state of being ruled by a king. And so the kingdom of God is about recognizing the rule and reign of God, that he is the king of kings, lord of lords, and that he has authority over all things, and all of history is under his command. So I don't know if you've ever challenged yourself to go through the entire biblical story or summarize it in 5, 10, 15 minutes. But it's a lot of fun. Uh, but anyways, I think if you, if you try to summarize it, you'll notice that the kingdom of God is really what's driving the whole thing. And it starts off with Genesis 1 and 2, how God is, in the beginning, God is creating an amazing cosmos. He's creating the sky, the seas, and the land, and he's filling it up with living, uh, with living creatures. And with this cosmos that he's made, he decides to give it to humanity. And another thing to point out in the creation narrative is there is no rival. There is no one that God is battling with. It's just God says this, and it happens. God's want, God wants this, and it's so. Um, and so there is, it, it, it is just him commanding the cosmos as the king. And so when he, built, when he creates this amazing cosmos, he says, I want to give it to my imagers. And as imagers, we know that's humanity. Humanity is his imagers. Our status, uh, the label of being his imager comes with the commission. And that in Genesis 1, it says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that... And I just want to pause that so that, in, in my mind, is just bold. It's what is the so that that we're made in the image of God for? Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock of the ground. And so this status, this label as an imager of God, comes with the commission of ruling, but it also, it's, it's a royal status. It's a status that is supposed to have an immense value in relation to the rest of the very good creation that God's made. And he wants, and he gives it over to humanity so that they may rule. Humanity is like this middle management that they're supposed to represent and be rulers that represent God's likeness over the whole cosmos, but partner with God in it, that they learn they learn from God how to properly care and cultivate his creation. And as we know in Genesis 3, it goes south, where humanity decides, I'm not going to represent God and do what God wants me to do. Rather, I'm going to rule and define what good and bad is on my own terms, what's harmful and beneficial on my own terms. And, that, and God respects that decision. And it goes horribly wrong. And the following chapters just show how humanity is spiraling and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. 
So Genesis is the beginning of all things, the beginning of the story. It's the beginning of the problem, and then it's also the beginning of the solution, where God then goes to a man in his family, Abraham, and says, through you, the whole world or all the nations will be blessed, and that God is going to bring about a nation through Abraham. And so the rest of the book of Genesis is pretty much exploring this idea hey, how does the family of Abraham do in dealing with the nations? Do they, good, uh, do they do a good job blessing the nations? Most often, not so much. Sometimes, yeah. And also a big part of Genesis is seeing the family of Abraham grow into a nation, that there are around 70 people by the time Genesis ends. And then that drives us into Exodus. And so now there's a problem, though, that... Israel is now enslaved to a false king, a king that's not representing God's likeness, but is taking advantage of Israel for his own benefit. And God knows, or God sees it and says, well, if I want them to be a blessing to all the nations, it's not going to work by them being enslaved. And so he does the ten, he does the ten plagues, and then he brings them out, and he brings them through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and this is a crucial point in the biblical story where God invites Israel, the nation of Israel, the promised nation to Abraham. He says, I want to partner with you. I want you to be a light to the world. I want you to be an example of what it means to rule and follow and submit yourself to the rule of God, the reign of God. And so he gives them the law. That's what the Torah is. And Israel is overwhelmingly excited and in agreement that this is going to be awesome. Like, look at all these amazing things that God's done and this amazing thing that he's inviting us into. They just need to be faithful and submit themselves to the rule and reign of God. But the problem is, is they don't, and they don't do so great. And then that in of itself gets worse and worse and worse, and it spirals. And as we just read in 1 Samuel 8, we, you know, fast-forwarding hundreds of years, we get to the Israelites recognizing that, man, we're in a really bad situation. We've really messed things up. I know what the problem is. We're like like every other nation because we don't have a king like every other nation. And so they see as we need a king, that will solve our issues. And then Samuel, who's incredibly frustrated by this, he goes to God and God responds with, They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Warn them strongly and tell them the practice of the king over them. And from there we see that the kings do not represent, the kings of Israel and later Judah, they don't represent, they don't represent God's likeness very well. And so we get Saul, who starts off okay but ends very poorly. David, who starts off really great and ends not so great. God, he has tons of family drama and controversy there. And then it gets into Solomon, who's wishy-washy in the beginning. Does, he has his good moments, but then it ends poorly. And then that brings us into the period of the kings in the, in the book of First and Second Kings. And at the, in Second Samuel, we have that God is promising David, I'm going to bring a king from your line that is going to reign forever and ever. It's going to be the king that Israel really, really needs. And so in Kings, the book of Kings, it's trying to set you up in examining generation after generation of kings. Is this the son of David? Is this the son of David? Is this the king that God promised? And it's no, 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 no. Some do well, some do okay. Some do terribly, most do terribly, terribly poor. And in the midst of this chaos and madness, the prophets develop this image and really expand what it means to be under the reign of the son of David, that there'll be everlasting life, peace and justice and righteousness forever. But then the prophets also understand that the real issue is not just the kings of Israel, but it's also everybody in Israel. The problem is that the kings of Israel are really no different from everybody else. 
and that they struggle with Israel's not special in this, that, they, that the whole, all of humanity, the whole world struggles with hardened hearts and stubborn disobedience. And when the Son of David comes, God's Spirit will be poured out and they'll be given hearts of flesh. And so from there, again, in the, in the book of Kings, just Israel is getting worse and worse and worse. And God then recognizes that they are no better than the nations that he has judged and that he has punished for their, for their rebellion. And so he gives, he gives Israel over to what they deserve, their consequences. And then that's the exile. And then from exile, God continues, though, in his faithfulness that he has promised one from the woman that will crush the serpent's head, one of the son of David, uh, the son of David, and that the nations have not been blessed yet through the family of Abraham. And so then we come into the Gospels, Matthew. And in the first line, Matthew says that Jesus is the son of David, and he's the Messiah. Matthew is claiming that Jesus is the promised king that Israel has been looking for for thousands of years. The king that's going to bring everlasting peace, justice, life. And then in Jesus, or, or when we get to the Gospels, the Gospel authors three times use the same way or use the same statement to summarize what Jesus is preaching about. It's twice in Matthew and, uh, and once in Mark, and it is, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Luke phrases it a little bit differently. He says, this is Jesus in Luke 4, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities because I was sent for this purpose. In Luke 4, Jesus is saying one of his primary reasons why he's here, one of the primary reasons and purposes that he is here is to preach the kingdom of God. And 46 unique, uh, there are 46 unique parables with the vast majority of them starting off with the kingdom of God is like. And they describe what it means to currently live out the kingdom of God, but also what will the kingdom of God look like when it comes to its fulfillment. Right before, or the Sermon on the Mount is the largest collection of Jesus' ethical teachings. It's some of his biggest hits when it comes to obedience and faithfulness to God and what he asks of his followers. Right before the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it can, there's a chapter break, and it can be kind of hard to see what is the context that which we're then coming into the Sermon on the Mount, and it's that Jesus is saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, and then he's going around doing miracles. And through his preaching and his miracles, he's accumulating a large crowd. And from this large crowd, Jesus then sits down to do the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll argue that Jesus' miracles are a demonstration of the kingdom of God. We get this a little bit from Isaiah 35. Isaiah, the, the section of scripture pretty much says, to summarize it, that in the new Jerusalem, in the future Zion, after all of those who have rebelled and, disobe uh, and choose to continually disobey God and, and live apart from him, after he has punished and judged them all, the blind will see, the deaf shall hear, the lame shall leap like deers, and the mute shall shout for joy. Those are all miracles that we see Jesus doing. And I encourage you, when you read the Gospels and you see Christ allowing the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the lame to walk and leap like deer, and the mute to shout for joy, whenever you see that, Jesus is trying to show us a little bit of a glimpse of what it's going to look like in the new heavens and the new earth when the kingdom of God is fully recognized. From there, we get that Jesus is enthroned as king on the cross. How the first person to recognize Jesus is the rightful king in the Gospel of Matthew, the first time someone unironically calls Jesus king, is the Roman guard after he sees Jesus die on the cross. 
Jesus resurrects. He's around for 40 days. And then we get into the first chapter of Acts where he says that he appeared, or that Acts says he appeared to them for 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And then he speaks to the disciples about the spirit. The disciples misunderstand. They think that the kingdom of God, they've misunderstood Jesus for three years. That they, uh, they think that he's establishing the kingdom of Israel. That there's going to be this political kingdom like the one of David and that, that they just long for. But then Jesus tells them that the kingdom of God is, the timing is mysterious. And they're to wait for the Spirit. Around the same time, Jesus says, because all of authority on heaven and on earth has now been given to me, he says, now go and make disciples of all nations. Because Jesus is king over all things, that's why we can go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and preaching the word. And then Paul picks this up and says that at one point, at some point, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord and also that God is king. And fast forward, this brings us to the last chapter of the Revelation, the last chapter of the whole book in the, uh, of the Bible. And when we read that, we read it earlier, you see that the tree of life is back, the river of life from Genesis 2 is back, and then you also see that humanity is back as rulers over God's creation. And that can be kind of hard to pick up, but I'm just going to reread it, the, the last few verses one more time. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. That you and I will be back into that Edenic ideal, but not the same, not the exact same, but a lot better, because we'll have glorified bodies, will be in a glorified, resurrected body in the likeness of Christ. But that, that initial ideal, that initial creation, that initial project that God was doing, that he wanted this cosmos would be a gift to humanity, he's not done. And that's what we'll find in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know about you, but I find that entire story incredibly inspiring. I find the fact that that's, this, is, this is a story that we get to study. It's a story that we get to um, talk about and, and uh, make sense of, but it's not just this foreign story that's really nice that I get to, some, you know, I get to talk about it every now and then, but it's, it is that but it's also so much more in that it is the story that you're called into. And when Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about what does it mean to live out the kingdom of God, he gives us, he gives us commandments that just encourage radical righteousness. Challenging teachings that we still to this day find remarkable. Remarkable. And that's what God is calling us into when it comes to the kingdom of God, a radical righteousness, to live in right relationship with God and with our neighbor. And I have, I have five things that I am deeply convinced when it comes to what it means to live radically righteous for the kingdom of God. And the first one is that you and I have been saved to work for and admire God. Paul says that you and I have been saved for good works. We're not saved by good works but we're invited into the adventure of doing God, good works and partnering with God. It can be hard in this culture to not want to be a consumer and not to see ourselves as a servant to the community rather than someone who's consuming the benefits of being in a community. But I encourage you that being a part of the kingdom of God is being encouraged and strengthened by others, but then also pouring into and lifting up others. I'm convinced that we're to, we're to have integrity, such integrity that it causes doubt in an unbeliever's unbelief. I had the privilege of listening to John Mark Comer. Some of you may know him. He wrote the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he, 
when I, when I heard him say this, it was bone chilling. He says that if we're embarrassed to invite someone to live life with us because maybe we don't have our ducks in a row enough or whatever, then I don't think we should be worrying about making disciples in that moment, but rather our obedience. We'll never be completely perfect. And I think part of that, when you invite someone into your life to walk alongside you, I think part of them will recognize that, yeah, he's not or she's not perfect. But if we are embarrassed because we think that we don't fit the bill, we got other, we got other things to worry about. I'm convinced that if we're afraid to talk about the good news with unbelievers, it's probably because we don't talk about it with believers enough. The Greek word to preach the good news is euangelizo, and Jesus and Paul both euangelizo to not just unbelievers, but believers as well, in that as Christians, we never graduate from the gospel. We're supposed to hear the good news and be filled by it regularly. And by talking about it with others, we become more equipped and more encouraged and excited to talk about it with those who don't know what it is. Oftentimes, we can quote songs in movies. I, my, my uncle, he quotes movies like no one else. It is every other line that comes out of him. And I, just, and, and I look at that and I wish, well, what if I could quote scripture like that? What if I could talk about the good news like that? That it's just second nature. You just, it's almost as if it's your intrusive thought to speak scripture or to share some good news about the kingdom of God. I remember, man, I, I said this at Monadnock trip with the middle schoolers. <laughs> I brought up Fortnite and they couldn't stop talking about Fortnite for 15 minutes. Um, Seriously, 15 minutes. That's, that doesn't sound very long, but when you're trying to reel them in for 15 minutes, it feels like an eternity. And, uh, and I was just thinking, if, if everybody, if all Christians talked about the good news and the gospel, like my middle schoolers talked about Fortnite, the world would be a completely different place. I'm deeply convinced that we often confuse proximity with intimacy. And that if I'm checking off the boxes of reading and praying, then I'm in a really good spot. Those are disciplines that are imperative for the Christian walk in developing a heart of Christ. But I'd like to challenge you to not see it as something that I need to check off, but something that is a discipline that will steward and cultivate a heart that will want to pour into and just admire God even more. Pour into others and admire God. And my last point is, I am deeply convinced that we are educated way beyond our obedience. If I asked you how, how good is your understanding of politics, I, I know many, many who would get very excited about that. That's a way of putting it. Um, if I asked many how excited are you, or how deep is your theology? Many would get really excited about that, and that's a good thing. Theology is great. Don't get me wrong. But if I asked how deep are you pouring in, how deep is your ministry, how deep are you pouring into others, and being a yes man to love others, for me, and for I th assume many, that is a more challenging question to answer. Theology is great. It's, it's it's needed. We need to have sound theology, especially if we're going to go and represent and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. But let's also make sure that we're not just clinging gongs, but loving others. I'd just like to close with just a reminder that when, it, when Jesus ends his Sermon on, the Mount, uh, a Sermon on the Mount, he talks about how we have a choice that we could enter through the narrow gate or we can enter through the wide gate. How we can bear good fruit or we can be bearers of bad fruit. How we can build our house on the rock or we can build our house on the sand. 
And I, and I don't know why, when I heard this statement, it hit me. It really shouldn't be, <laughs> it really shouldn't be revolutionary. Um, but the statement is, we don't accidentally do hard things. And when Christ says that going through the narrow gate is really hard, I immediately think of the phrase, you don't accidentally do hard things. In another sense, it could be living out the kingdom of God is really, really hard. And we don't accidentally do hard things. And so I encourage you to make the conscious decision to really represent the kingdom of God and to see yourself as a part of this meta-narrative that doesn't just have a purpose or have value, but it is what gives value to all narratives, I think. Let me pray to close. Father God, I thank you for your story. And I thank you that you invite us into your story and that this is not a story of that we need to fasten up and just hit the grind and just make our own self-discipline and, and, and conquer, you know, conquer the world with our flesh. But no, Lord, that you have equipped us with the Spirit and that you empower us with your Spirit to have a heart of flesh that harmonizes in its beat with yours. And Lord, that you give us self-discipline through the Spirit to represent you, and that that is why we've been made to represent you. And that one day we'll represent you as rulers of the cosmos, partnering with you and learning and and. Yeah, learning from you. So Lord, may we continue to make that conscious decision to live out the kingdom of God. In your name we pray, amen.
Yep, I hope that happened again. This benediction um, is one that I means a lot to me in the just in the context of it's in Numbers chapter six. It's what Aaron is supposed to say to all of Israel. And right after this, they go through they go through the wilderness, tons of temptation, and it doesn't always go well. But nonetheless, God is faithful and God sticks with them. And his presence is with them the whole way. And so it is, speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, in, the, in this way you shall bless the sons of Israel. You are to say to them, the Lord bless you.